Are you there? Okay. Alright, can you guys hear me? No. Maybe I can hear you. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> The technology works. Um, it's the first pro technology event that I've been involved in um, seamlessly. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, it's great to see such a strong attendance for an important film at a particularly challenging time of year for such events. So I uh, really appreciate the interest that people have shown in this film. Um, I think it's a it's a beautiful film uh, with, that gives us lots to talk about, and we have a fantastic panel to assist us through this. Who said that wasn't me? Um, so my name is Lizzie, I'm a lawyer and I'm also a writer uh, and I've written a book about technology and history which I think is probably why I've been invited to speak, uh, to moderate this panel um, but I sit on um, a couple of different boards including Digital Rights Watch and Blueprint for Free Speech as well. Um, but my other panellists are much more interesting so um, I might start with to my right, to your left, um, is Dr. Sula Dreyfus. Uh, she has been part of an international team looking at the impact of technology on whistleblowing and wrongdoing. She also researches projects in e-health and e-education areas and she lectures in the field of cyber security. Is that feedback bothering anyone else or is yeah. it just me? Okay. Okay. Maybe just take it a little lower down your health. Is this better? Maybe. Yeah. Okay. If it's, if it's really objectionable, raise your hands and I'll use the handheld. Um, so, so let's interesting include privacy technologies and how they affect uh, the balance between the state and the citizen. And she's the author of Underground, a fantastic book which has been translated into seven languages and been made into two films. And prior to entering academia, she was a journalist, a professional journalist actually at a major Australian newspaper. Next up, I've got Sam Foyani next to me, uh, next to Sula. Sam plays a key role in delivering the Code Like a Girl's mission, which is to provide women and girls with the confidence, tools, and knowledge to enter and flourish in the world of coding. Sam is fiercely committed to the ethics of technology. After several years working in information privacy, she now sits on the board of the Australian Privacy Foundation. She's pursuing a postgraduate study degree in data science and she almost immediately recognised the lack of diversity in her degree and joined Code Like a Girl in 2017. But she's worked and volunteered for a very long time on various uh, campaigns in the gender equality space. And lastly, to my right, to your left, is, is Dr Chris Enger. Chris's work focuses on the intersection of human and computer vision for tasks such as scene recognition, visual search and depth perception in natural scenes. She received her PhD in the Department of Brain and Cognitive Sciences at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And prior to joining the University of Melbourne, she was a postdoc at Harvard Medical School and a VISTA postdoctoral fellow at the Centre for Vision Research at York University. So please welcome our fantastic panel. Love all women panel. So can, I, can we perhaps start with you, Chris, because this is your field. Can you tell us a little bit about the technology, which wasn't, which was obviously talked about in the film, but perhaps you could explain in technological terms how it is that Lena is someone who we don't see, but is present when we look at images in the digital age. Uh, okay, so I think the film did a pretty good job explaining it. Lena is a very commonly used test image in computer vision. So when people design a new algorithm for image compression or image smoothing or doing artistic effects to images, when you publish, publish a paper, you want to illustrate it with a nice classic image. And that photograph is one of the most common choices. And it's been used in probably thousands of different papers. Um, I think you still can see it in conferences today. So it, it isn't used to train image algorithms per se, but it's the classic test image that we use to compare every iteration of every algorithm. Against previous versions. Was there any need to use that specific image? I remember reading, um, I think it's from the discussion around this film actually, that some, uh, I think another paper once used an image of Fabio. Yeah, <laughs> I think the Fabio image was specifically a protest against this I one. I like it. Um, yeah, so there's a few other choices people have used. Um, the most common male image is probably a portrait of Albert Einstein, but it's black and white, so you don't see it everywhere. Um, there are other color photographs that people can use. Usually when people are picking a test image, they like to use ones that have been used before, just because then you can immediately compare it to a previous paper. And they look for images that have lots of qualities, like textured regions, untextured regions, lots of colors, lots of different details, small details, big details. A human face is nice. 
Um, and just a, an attractive, nice image to really just sell your poster or your paper. So I think that's why this one was so popular, because it kind of hit every checkbox. So it's interesting because, of course, we talk about this as a bit of a blind spot in the sense that we don't actually see Lena, but she's obviously been quite influential in how many people engage with the field of, um, of imaging and, and computer science generally. But we've probably other, got other kinds of ways in which we can see some of this sexism present in tech, and others on the panel may wish to speak to this as well. But one that comes for, to mind for me is people doing similar research to yours, but in relation to voice recognition talking about Alexa, for example, um, and why it's necessary to have Alexa respond in a female voice. Uh, and that often also research when you get access to data that comes out of Amazon, for example, evidences um, a, an abusive relationship sometimes with Alexa, which I found deeply alarming. Um, does, do, do, what other blind spots do we, do we see in this way? I mean, this, this is not the only example of kind of implicit sexism within the tech sector. Do other ones come to mind for, for you, Chris, or? I, I can think of a couple of examples. So, for example, um, object detectors are trained mostly on images from the US. If you use them anywhere outside of the US, there's a good chance they won't recognize exactly the same objects because they're not used to the, the different contexts. What kind of objects are you talking about? Uh, just common objects, you know, a bottle, a bar of soap, um, fruit, clothing. These things look different in different uh, countries. Uh, they might be found in different parts of the house or different locations, and the algorithms don't have any way of switching context, so they're, they're very geared towards the American context in which they were trained. And people often don't realize that before they start deploying these algorithms outside the U.S. And so Sam, why do you think this happens? What, what's the cause driving these kinds of careless um, misunderstandings of the universal application of these when they're actually quite culturally specific? <coughs> well, I, mean, I, think, I think the documentary definitely like made it really clear that it is a, it is a diversity issue at the heart there in terms of the people who are creating the tech, coming up with the, the solutions to what they perceive to be the problems that we face, um, are predominantly coming from a, you know, one, one gender and also, more often than not, from one race. Like I, I definitely want to highlight as well that, that this is, obviously we're talking in a gender context here, but there are so many other intersections where this comes out to play in terms of race, in terms of sexuality, in terms of socioeconomic status, it all comes out. Um, and so, yeah, if you if you think about, if we have a homogenous way of thinking about solving problems with tech, then of course we're going to end up with uh, solutions that only solve one aspect of those problems. So it also creates problems of carelessness in things like how we might understand a concept like privacy, for example, and so that you might have something to say about this. Um, how we understand privacy settings might be different if we're a vulnerable person as opposed to the person in the average technology company who might not face those same difficulties. Um, something like a ring comes to mind for me. Uh, people may have seen stories about this, about how the doorbell that allows you to have a camera to see who's out the, who's out the front has also been subject to huge numbers of hacks by quite nefarious actors, which is perhaps not something that people thought might happen. And how does this affect our understanding of things like privacy, not just people who create the technology, but people who are then using it? So one of the things I think is really interesting out of the discussion this film creates is a, a, a debate and discussion around permissioning. Because really this is about permissioning. Um, and it's permissioning not just of a piece of paper that Lennon might have signed in 1972, um, or Playboy didn't sign when the image was used uh, by researchers around the world since then, but permissioning about use, reuse, repurposing. Um, and that has a wider debate, as you were talking about, for all of our rights. So that's about the right to privacy. Do I give permission for this app to take this information about my geolocation and data match with someone else and sell it to somebody? Um, well, what, you know, how does that particularly affect women? That's things around issues of domestic violence, of wanting to have your anonymity and your privacy kept. You may be concerned about stalking. Those are just uh, particular examples. But it's also permissioning in other ways. Is it okay in a workplace to behave in a certain way towards someone? And whether that person is of the same gender, a different gender, uh, you know, different sexuality, or, or any number of differences. We are in a new stage, and that stage of our evolution, I hope, 
uh, is around greater recognition of the human rights we have both online and in person. So this question, this debate, is a really good one to have because it chimes into that issue of what permission do we want to hold back? What permission do we don't know that we don't realize we're giving? Yes, yeah, so one of the uh, kind of slogans that's commonly associated with the tech industry is move fast and break things, for example, um, I, I, which I think displays the sense that they don't really, they're not thinking about who might have to, who might be the person that picks up the pieces once you've broken something, you know. So um, I do think there's a shift now because, of course, that was Facebook's slogan and they've since dropped it, which I think is probably a sign of progress. Um, Sam, why do you think this issue is so hot right now? What do you think is? Is this tapping into <laughs> the, the move fast and break things um, slogan really annoys me because um, it's like, well, you, you don't have any skin in the game. It's easy to say that if when you break things, it's not your exactly. livelihood on the line, you know? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think those things. I completely got sidetracked. What was your question? <laughs> well, what, it's obviously, you know, this, this film comes at a particular time. Well, I want to talk right. about this, yeah, this particular moment we're in. Well, I think there's a there's a broader movement happening slowly, very, very slowly, and it's been happening for a very long time, but I think we're starting to get a bit more momentum, uh, dare I say it, in the femin feminism space. There's, mm, it could be a word for some people to deal with. But I think that there is a, there's momentum happening in all areas, and tech is not uh, immune to that. I think that more and more people are getting really frustrated. Like we all interact with technology, well, most of us do, in our day-to-day -day lives. We use it for all kinds of things, accessing services, um, finding a date, finding um, you know, information about health and all sorts of things. And when the, the technology that you're using lets you down um, time and time again because of your, your gender or, or whatever, then that sort of builds up a level of, of frustration. I think also people are coming on to the fact that the future of work is changing and there's some really significant potential risks for who's getting left behind in that in that shift. Like who who are the people who are gonna end up struggling to find work once automation really kicks off, once we're looking at you know jobs that demand high technical skills. As it currently stands, women do stand to be left behind in that, and that's a really huge economic issue. Um, I would love to think that we would be pursuing diversity for diversity's sake, but the unfortunate reality is, is that I think often we, we need sort of more things to point out as why it's important, and, and the economic one can be a really big one for a lot of people. Mm. Chris, do you see evidence of that change occurring from, say, when you were a student at MIT to now? How do you perceive that shift? Uh, for more inclusivity or... Um, I'm not sure it's changed that much, honestly, just over my career. Uh, I mean, there were issues when I was an undergrad, there were issues when I was a grad student, there are issues today. Um, there certainly are people making an effort, like they mentioned how the curriculum was changed. Um, you know, I guess we, here we have the hiring push to get more women academics, but there's definitely still a long ways to go. Like, the percentage of women in tech and academia has not changed very significantly since I was a student, I don't think. Well, one of the things that comes to mind for me as well is that the Google walk-off that occurred um, last year, I think, uh, getting my using stuff as we, uh, this decade closes, um, uh, where thousands of Google workers walked off the job organising using Google tools uh, to protest payouts to a senior executive who was accused of sexual harassment, which I think is kind of a stunning turnaround um, from what you might have expected uh, in years gone by. So. I, I do wonder whether there is perhaps a change of foot in the industry where they feel that they might be more vulnerable to criticism if they don't deal with these things properly. Um, I mean, do you think students these days are interested in seeing that or, or that, that gives them comfort? Yeah, so I, I guess there are some steps in the right direction. So, for example, I think the US uh, granting agencies have recently either has to consider the change where they're not going to fund people who have been accused of sexual harassment, for example. So there's some effort to actually hold people accountable. Yeah, I mean, and even some of the scandal that fell out at um, in various institutions as a result of the Jeffrey Epstein scandals, or the other tech people who might have been involved in taking money from him um, when he was involved in soliciting underage um, 
or in rape of children, is what I should say, um, uh, that that seems like a positive sign, that they feel a bit accountable in some ways, even if it is baby steps towards a more inclusive industry. Sure, there was definitely some follow-up from that. Yeah. So I was going to just add, I think one of the things besides just um, you know, us telling the tech industry they need to take women more seriously, diversity more seriously, is also trying to present a positive attitude to them to the extent that, for example, in cybersecurity, um, you will do better in a lot of situations if you have a more diverse team. So if you are red teaming, if you're trying to create a, a team who are actually your friends, but they're trying to attack um, your system uh, so that you can check its robustness, um, you are going to have a, a better amount of robustness if the team that is attacking you is more diverse because they will find more interesting ways to attack you. And that might simulate better, obviously, the kind of attacks that you might have on a real adversary. So that's not unlike creative teams, people who put together grants, people who put together long-term research projects. You need that diversity of thinking. Um, and I guess the other thing that's really important is to understand that it's not just about um, affecting women uh, or people of color. Um, if we have things like algorithmic bias, it's also going to affect things like men over 55 who are applying for jobs on job sites. Right? So there's exclusion that may go on there. Oh, you're, you're over 55, we're just going to automatically exclude you and it's invisible. So in some ways, the exclusion that, that is already starting to happen in that sphere um, has kind of hit the population who might have been, in one sense, responsible for choosing Lena, <laughs> and the basis of choosing it. And, and hopefully, in that sense, it will, you know, the chickens will come home to roost, and there'll be greater awareness about it and some action and transparency on it. Yeah, that makes sense to me. I mean, do you think diversity, diversity is something that industry does think is important and is interested in changing, Sam, in your work? I mean, yeah, how open to <laughs> these things are they? Because, I mean, there's a rod and a stick, right? There's the thrill of being honest. You like. Tell the truth. No, look, there, there are definitely some amazing companies out there that are trying to, to make changes, and many of them are our, our partners. Shout out to our partners. Um, but, but there's also, um, and, they, and they do see it as a positive thing. They see it as a positive thing just as like a human rights issue, but they also see it as, as a positive thing in terms of the, you know, the creativity aspect, the diversity of ideas, <coughs> different solutions and things like that. They see it as a money maker as well. Like let's not shy away from that. It does, it does um, make money. Um, but then there are also many, many companies out there who have caught on to the fact that it is so hot right now and uh, sort of attempt to do this kind of like pink washing Thing, where they sort of like virtual virtue signal that they're doing the right thing, they're putting all the right things in place, at least public facing they are, but then behind the scenes are not really doing any kind of meaningful change. And when I what I mean by that is like they're not willing to put their money where their mouth is for one thing. They're not willing to change any kind of HR policies around to make the workplace more um, you know more friendly to women and minorities. They're not. Um, changing the sort of the, the culture that happens not just at the workplace but outside the workplace in terms of like where you do your socialising, where you bond with people, where you then get the leg ups later on down down the road. Um, so there is a lot of that happening um, because they know that it's it's there's a reputational issue there and also that it's the people are starting to demand a sense of ethics and a sense of um, fairness. But it's not good enough to just be like, oh yeah, we love equality, <laughs> and then not actually doing the work. And there's a lot of that happening still, unfortunately. Do you feel the same way, Chris? What do you think things? Like? Yeah, I would agree. There's a bit of that in academia too. Uh, people say the right things, but it's not clear it's really making substantial change. And what would be your vision for how, or what's your vision for a better, uh, more uh, inclusive? tech academic space, but also do you think there's things that could do? I mean, the University of Melbourne has obviously pledged not to use Lennox, that's a good start, but that feels like um, something that's somewhat overdue and, you know, but full credit to them and hopefully... We're the other universities. <laughs> yeah, we're, well, exactly. Let's hope they're one of many. 
But um, let the, are there other things that come to mind for you that would improve um, in the inclusive nature of academia? Well, having a general rule that we don't use pornographic images, in addition to that, is probably a good rule. rule. I'm for that rule. Uh, but I should point out this is not the only offensive image that we don't use as testing. Can you tell us more about that? What else? Oh, uh, it's just not that uncommon to go to a conference and see a different Playboy model or you know, a fairly suggestive image of a woman used as just a generic test image. For the same reasons, you know, you want an image that's striking, it's going to get attention, it's going to get people clicking on your poster. Yeah. If remember that should be the first amount no use of pornographic images yeah. in your field. Don't, don't use offensive images, seems like a good general rule. Yeah. Um, but I, I think we also need to do more substantial things to, to try to make technology more inclusive. I don't think I know exactly what those are. Um, I think we do a pretty good job of getting people into the pipeline, but we still have a pipeline problem where every year you have fewer and fewer women and minorities. Um, so we're not doing something right along the way, I think, to, to keep people in the pipeline. Yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, I suppose the other thing I would say is that I do think yeah. women are powerful. Like, I'm thinking about um, Susan from Uber, who wrote the blog post and essentially took down Travis Colony, which I think... Susan Fowler. Fowler, exactly, thank you, excuse me. She's now, I think, an opinion editor at the New York Times, so things seem to have gone well for her in calling out sexism of one of the um, fated uh, CEOs of Silicon Valley, Inc., and he lost his job. Now, he also is still got his fingers in that pie, but um, the point being that when people do speak out about things, it can have an impact in all sorts of ways that they're both expected and others to be expected. I mean, is that your plan at, at kind of like a girl trying to cultivate people who are prepared to also call these things out and be the first mover that can hopefully initiate broader discussions? Yeah, I think oh, it's tricky, right? Because if you're that person in the office who's like, oh, feminism, this isn't cool, don't do that, that can, it's not a quick way to make friends a lot of the time. And, um, which is challenging, right? Because we need people who call it out and be like, this is not okay, this action is not okay, this policy is not okay, etc. cetera. Um, but they often end up being ostracized or penalized in sometimes overt ways, sometimes covert ways. And so there isn't a lot of incentive to, to be that person who stands up and says something, uh, especially if you are one of the few women in the room and you're not sure if people are gonna like have your back or not. So, that's really tricky. And so I think that it's really important that we do have uh, allies and not, it shouldn't, the burden shouldn't rest on the oppressed to have to do all of the work. You know, we need, uh, we need big tech and we need academia, we need um, men, basically, to show up and, and also play their role in this. And that is, is tricky. And I think one of the issues that Code Like a Girl faces a lot of the time is that often we end up sort of preaching to the choir. You know, the people who come to our events are already on board. People come and see this film, they're already across it to a certain degree, they're, or they're at least interested and open to the ideas. It's the people who aren't coming along to these things, it's the people who are only going to like your stereotypical like tech bro meet up with beer and pizza and, and, and are blind to this. And when you start chatting with those people, it becomes really evident that they're the kinds of people that we need to get on side for there to be some serious um, movement happening and that's a really challenging thing to do and Code Like a Girl definitely does strive to have those conversations but the very nature of our brand and our audience and our community is that we're not necessarily reaching um, all the people who really need, in my opinion, need to hear it. Uh, so it's tricky, it's, it's, it's really challenging but Code Like a Girl does aim to provide a space at least where if you are experiencing that kind of thing in your workplace, in your internship, in your studies or whatever, at least you have a community where you can come and meet other people and be like, oh, this thing happened and that really sucked and I kind of think I'm going to drop out of tech because it's awful and everyone's crap and uh. You can come to, to, to a community event um, or, or get online and chat with us and you can see that there are other people around there who, who are dealing with similar things and that, that can be really powerful in terms of keeping people in the industry and, and building up that sense of resilience to them to then, um, you know, maybe one day bring it up and be that annoying person at a meeting. So like, if you were in charge of a university or a company, what would you do? <laughs> um, 
<laughs> so I uh, love to be the Tsarina. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I do think there are good things, um, uh, important initiatives that um, this university has had, for example, is uh, having a tutorial session that is geared particularly for um, uh, females in a subject. I think that's a great initiative Ken's had. Um, although controversial, and I'm not sure that Top Tech Ready on 3AW loved it, but... Um, <laughs> must be something right. <laughs> exactly, I think that's success. <laughs> the definition, if you get argument from 3AW, you are on the side of right. Um, <laughs> Just to say, they refused to post the clip, so apparently my and, response was too logical for them. Oh, yeah, we can't have rationality, that was in the day. But um, uh, they had work on the philosophy of um, uh, rationality of climate change. Um, but the, <laughs> I think so that stuff matters, and it doesn't have to be seen as exclusionary to males. The idea is to give some support um, to girls who are struggling. And I mean, I see this in all sorts of other ways. So uh, my daughter is in an advanced math class in her high school, and she came one home one day and said to me, you know, there were five girls in this class, and three of them have dropped out. And there was her and one girl left, and about a dozen boys. and she said, but the head of the math program for the entire school came and sat down and said to the class and said to the girls, please don't leave. We will help you. We will be here at lunchtime. Stick with it. Stay with us. And it's made a difference. It's one of the reasons she has stayed in the advanced math class. And it's that simple thing, that 15 minutes, that has been a tipping point. So I think that those small acts, as much as big ones, um, and even, you know, just acts like this make a big difference to, to doing it. I think that social events and camaraderie among girls on campus, um, that matters. So I had, as a um, student in my subject, one of the uh, young women who runs the IS and Women um, uh, Student Society here, uh, and she was talking about how this camaraderie is really important to her. Um, and, and I could see that in her company, she was very confident. Um, and that made a big difference. So these things, these this sort of smattering of things that overlay, that cover the whole sort of experience make a big difference. Um, I also think that equal pay really matters. Um, <laughs> and, and that means starting salaries as well as promotions. Um, and, and this uni is, is really starting to actively uh, address that. I think that matters, and it matters for optics as well as reality. I mean, it's quite interesting. I study whistleblowing the impact of digital technology. What people often don't realize because they think about the Pentagon Papers or sort of big profile whistleblowing cases is the history of whistleblowing in terms of number of cases was originally primarily about sexual harassment at work. So most of the cases that you saw when whistleblowing really started in the 1980s, 70s, and 80s was about women who were in junior positions revealing, you know, kind of harassment and uh, and retaliation at work for revealing what had happened. So um, I am optimistic. If whistleblower protection can come this far in 30 or 40 years, uh, and Lena's being retired after, what, almost 50 years, um, then there is hope for the future, in my view. We just all have to work at it a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I might just uh, see if you guys want to offer anything as well, as well on, on that note, what kind of a vision for a more inclusive tech might look like, what kind of results we might achieve as well if we had more Involved. One thing I would just add as a writer at least, I've certainly noticed in the last couple of years that there's been an explosion of women writers in relation to technology and it's really telling the kinds of topics they focus on. So they tend to focus on things like the digitisation of welfare, which is problems that affect the women. Um, they tend to focus on education and the implications of um, technology in education settings, which I think is really interesting. Things that are often overlooked by men who write about technology and think about building colonies on Mars while neglecting problems that everyday people face and have real um, impact on their ability to live full lives. And I think it's, it kind of shows you what's possible if we had more women involved in all these spaces, we might also open up new areas of research and of, um, of analysis that could be very valuable for us as a whole. And I wondered if you guys wanted to offer any thoughts in that respect as well. Yes, I, I was going to add to that. Um, I think it's also important to have some way of holding people accountable or even just holding yourself accountable. Um, I think it, it really helps to analyze your own behavior and try to see if you are treating students differently or have some way of just making sure that you are treating everybody equally and giving every, everyone an equal opportunity, either at the individual level or department or whatever. 
Um, and in terms of, yeah, changes to the future, I imagine with more inclusion in tech, we'd be looking at a lot of different problems. Like, for example, you know, trolling online and privacy, how to improve online spaces for everybody. And so I think in the vision imaging space that you think is particular to them? I can't think of anything in terms of images off the top of my head. Um, although, of course, you know, the, there's all the problems of not being able to recognize things out of context, not being able to recognize certain faces because you weren't trained on them, not being able to recognize certain voices. So, yeah, it's all stuff we should improve. The tech would work for women, that's cool. Yeah, the <laughs> tech work for everybody because everyone is participating. What about you, Sam? Um, it's, a, it's a huge question. I think what you said before, though, about, about there being a lot of women who are writing on um, these particular areas. On that, I think there's, there's a lot of women in particular who are focusing on, on ethics, um, and I think that's really telling um, that that's still quite a, a female-dominated space. Um, <laughs> hopefully they continue to be, be dominating that space. Um, I envisage a future where I can hopefully drive a car that is just as safe for me to drive. I want my, um, you know, voice recognition to recognize my voice, although I don't really like using it because it's kind of just like normalizing surveillance. But anyway, um, <laughs> if I were to use it, I want it to at least recognize my voice. Because it's still, they still don't pick up your voice as well if it's high pitch versus low pitch, which is just insane. Um, I envisage a world where, you know, girls in primary school will pick maths and science um, and be excited about it and not see it as some kind of like dingy, boring thing that you do in the dark in a hoodie, um, but see it as something that's creative and that uh, involves all kinds of different skills, not just, um, you know, logical thinking and abstract thinking, although they are very important. Um, but to see it in, in, you know, in a, in a, in a bigger, picture and to see the scale of that. Uh, on a really broad level, beyond um, beyond tech, uh, like I think this comes hand in hand with a, with a bigger momentum where we don't let things like gender dictate to us what we can and can't do or what we think others can and can't do. Be that women in tech or be it you know men in, in, in other areas where it's it's female dominated or be it transgender people or a few all of these all of these intersections I think just kind of need to we need to stop placing so much emphasis on yeah these these uh, sort of perceived notions of what we can and can't do because of socialization. So I am cautiously optimistic, <laughs> but I don't think it's going to happen in a hurry. I think it's I think we've still got a lot of work ahead of us. Even though events like this are really um, sort of uplifting because we do get people in the room who obviously really care about it, um, and so that fills me with hope, but it's all, as I said before, it's all the people who are not in the room that um, that make it tricky on that just really quickly. When we were running the campaign for this, for like a girl online, we received like an unprecedented amount of trolling online. We get a bit of it anyway, because as soon as you, you know, if you talk about feminism online, you're going to get trolled, but this hit a nerve. This documentary really hit a nerve for a lot of people, and we received all kinds of awful, awful messages. But a lot of them defaulted back to this idea of being like, oh, well, women just aren't as interested in computers. Women just don't like tech. Women are just not naturally good at maths. Men are just better at logical thinking. And I just, I, I really, what I really hope for is that we break out of that way of thinking. For the anonymous, these uh, criticisms or, or were they anonymous? No, just like on Facebook and, and, and whatnot, just people. They were owning it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just, yeah. They weren't anonymous. I mean, I do think the digital revolution presents sort of immense opportunity to disorganize previous forms of oppression and to lose that chance feels um, just uh, like a, an enormous waste. And so this is an opportunity, I think, while we're starting to define what the rules of this digital age are, that we push really hard to make it an egalitarian space that's not um, importing these oppressive tendencies that we've had in the real world, real world meat space, into the digital future. And so I think that's probably what motivates a lot of us in doing this work. And I would say, I suppose, that um, even though we might all be in the choir, I think we can start singing to everybody else, and that's the job of getting into groups like this to then spread the message and 
pass on um, different ways of articulating answers to some of these traditional criticisms that are made of women in tech and finding ways to um, convince others who might be participating on this topic and turn them into advocates too. Um, so I think uh, we are now winding up, or did you? You want to open up the floor, fine. Um, so there is, there is, we've got a little bit of time left for anyone who may wish to ask a question. Uh, yes, I'm losing later in the, on the basis of inclusivity in check. What would you replace Lena with? Uh, so my favorite replacement is probably the mandrel, which is a close-up image of a monkey's face. It's got most of the same properties. It has great contrast of textured and non-textured regions. It's got great colors. It's a very striking image. It is a face of the human face. Um, yeah, and aside from that, uh, there's lots of great nature photos you can use, flowers, tigers, birds, architecture. I think there's a lot of options. Hi, I'm next door. Um, <laughs> Garrick uh, Gary from the University of Melbourne Law School. Um, one of the questions that Lizzie raised was, you know, what can we do? And uh, so I teach a law and tech subject in the law school. And I think for the last five years, I've probably had a majority of women in the, in the subject. But in that subject, another subject I teach, advocacy, I've been really conscious that I need to choose readings and people that come that reflect women. So in advocacy, for example, most of the readings when I came into the course were all from men. So I actually got the library to go and find a whole lot of resources written by women or about women advocates. So I think it's the same for role models in the tech area. If it's all men that come in to talk to the students, that's not so good. That's a comment, I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, yep, I had one. Um, should I just go? Yeah. Um, yeah, sometimes when um, I am part of conversations, um, not unlike this one, people use terms like male, female, and woman, and man, and they interchange man with male, and so people talk about discrimination against women. But I, I wonder if sometimes we might if, if, if the discrimination is based on what the body looks like or what the person behaves like, I think they might actually be quite di different things. And, um, and I wonder if sometimes when people experience discrimination it's because they don't have, in, if it is about the way the person behaves, if the person is behaving kindly opposite to, uh, for lack of a better term, a bit of an asshole, that is what society rewards, then is that what we should be on the lookout for? These behaviors that are destructive of collaboration and beneficial for society, rather than encouraging kind behaviors, and is that what we want? Uh, and rather than focusing the conversation on, I got, but I don't know if this is what is happening actually, on what a body looks like, because it might also happen, perhaps, let me just expand to this, that we might reward someone that looks in a very specific way, like what we think women look like, but they behave like an asshole because that is what society tells them they should behave like to be on top of society. So I guess my question is, what is it that we should be on the lookout for, or where is the source of this discrimination, the way a body looks like, or the way a person behaves like? I think that's, that's a complicated, the, the, the idea of, of gender socialization and what comes with that is, is really complicated and, and I think you've hit a very important point which is that, um, a few actually, <laughs> I'm going to try and unpack. I think we are stuck in operating in a, in a, in a binary and, and also like fixated on, on the physical form which isn't helpful, um, but I think that the, what's happening is that a lot of asshole behavior that you, you, that you um, reference is being done by, by anyone, but a lot of it is being done by men and because of that uh, socialization that we've all gone through 
that has led to a situation where they are in high positions of power. We we respond well to male styles of leadership that are assertive, often quite aggressive, um, are not particularly emotionally um, intelligent or sensitive, um, and so you know they're, they're not the most uh, accommodating traits uh, for a lot of people. We often associate. On the flip side, with women, we associate things like sensitivity and high emotionality and weakness and all of these other things that are, uh, are not necessarily true. But over the years, um, through gender socialization and, and thank you very much to the patriarchy, we've started to make these associations. And so I don't think it's as simple as being as being like, well, it's what they look like or it's how they behave. I think these things are interconnected, um, and I think that. We need to be on the lookout for that and always just aware of that complexity around those things. There's this um, study that was done a while ago um, about, it's like called Baby, Baby X. Um, and basically the, the gist of it was is that they had this, this very young baby and depending on what they would uh, tell the adult participants, um, what gender it was, the adult participants would, would interact with it in a different way. And they would describe it in a different way. They would be like, oh, she's so cute, she's so cuddly, she's so soft. Um, and, if, and if it was um, a male child, well, so they thought, like, oh, isn't he brave, isn't he strong, isn't he daring, or whatever. And also, it came out in the ways uh, the toys that they would give them. They would give the, they would give if they thought it was a girl baby, they'd give them soft toys, and if they thought it was a boy baby, they'd give them like, Lego and things like that. Um, which actually does feed into tech when you start thinking about how we start developing um, uh, like spatial thinking and problem solving and things like that. That's another story. But one of the things that I find really fascinating about that study is that they found that it would be. Um, the adult women who were involved in that um, in that study were just as bad, if not worse, than the men at perpetrating these gender stereotypes. So it's not just you know we, we can't just be like oh well yeah I'm, I'm a woman so I'm you know I, I, I'm fine. We're all part of this system. We all grow up in this system of gender socialization, and we all have to be thinking critically um, about how we send those messages, not just to young people but to everyone. And not just about physicality, and not just about traits, but how they intersect. That's a very unsatisfying answer. I'm sorry. <laughs> there is something to be said though that a lot of the traits that you describe, like um, sensitivity, um, being perhaps more caring and more um, emotionally intelligent, they are like strengths. They're not um, weaknesses. And I, I mean, obviously the socialisation of women is largely resulted in their oppression, but I don't think we should also necessarily assume that these things um, are binary in terms of how we resolve them. We could, we can take the, the best of what um, socialization has offered and, and kind of try and um, universalize that out. I think that's another way to think about the project of um, diversification within industries like tech. Yeah, I was say that there is a lot of evidence that it's how it's the body and or how people are perceived that affects how they are treated. So a, the exact same professor on an online course is seen as more intelligent if he's male. The exact same student is seen as better qualified if he's per, you know, presented as if he were male. Um, so it's like there there are socialization differences, but I think there's also the the exact same person will be treated very differently depending on what you think their gender is. I think we have time for one more question. There's still more drinks and food outside, um, which I'm very conscious of. Or maybe two if people are at it. But. Let's start here and then. Sorry, I don't want to hold the mic. Um, I'll try and make it fast. Um, how do we, so the picking the image and scanning it and then it suddenly becomes a standard and then all of this research um, refers back to the same test image because it's too hard to do the same work again with the previous like version of the algorithm and again forward and you know so it becomes this thing that snowball and becomes huge. That's actually I think um, typical of how many things have happened in the history of tech. Um, how do we get more deliberate going forwards? How do we avoid this kind of unconscious bias, like perhaps thoughtless but perhaps not malicious decision making going forwards? 
diversity, <laughs> right? Right, because often you don't think about it. I mean, you know, any number of people who um, who don't, for example, have any experience with uh, a trans transgender person won't necessarily feel comfortable. How do I address this person? How do I interact? How do I describe? And it's not there's not ill will. It's just confusion and lack of knowledge about it. But if you actually include a transgender person on your team, it changes everything. It changes how they think, how they talk, you know, how they interact, what the expectations are. So I think that's that's the best way to do it. Because I'm a lawyer, I just think everything should involve law. But what do you think says a lot about regulations? <laughs> what do you think about regulation? Like, why can't, you know, so I sort of think about some of these scandals in tech that have come out, like LinkedIn only advertising some jobs to people of a certain age, Facebook racially profiling its users to, again, provide advertisements for access to, to housing finance, like all sorts of terrible stuff that should never have happened. Um, Google organizing photos of um, African-American people into a label called Gorilla. Like, it's outrageous that this happened, you know, and it's like carelessness, really, because no one's thought, oh, maybe this might happen and we should stop it. Um, but I do sort of wonder if you're held legally accountable for discrimination, might that also be a tool, like the the carrot of having the benefits of diversity coupled with the stick of um, yeah, like I mean, I sort of think sometimes they should be sued, you know, and have to you know face consequences. But I'm, I'm not sure if you think the institution that achieves the change that's needed. Yeah, well, I think whatever whatever things you tell the company they can be sued over, they will think to test for those That's things. That's good to hear. Um, <laughs> and then, then there's probably still a further thing they're not testing for. Yeah. I think also when you think about things like the GDPR, for example, putting that into place is really, you know, kind of put fire. What's the GDPR? Also, oh, the uh, general data, data protection regulation <laughs> acronyms has really put like fire under the butt of a lot of companies and like, oh, okay, we actually have to start taking this seriously now. So, so yes, maybe there is some more scope for regulatory action. I, I just, uh, I'm a little bit uh, skeptical about that being able to keep up the pace. I also just wanted to add to, to Laura's question, um, I think diversity of demographics, people, definitely, but also diversity um, in the sense of like interdisciplinary skills. I think what we often face is that people enter this pipeline and, and sort of go through it and and that's great and they become like brilliant experts, but what can be missing then is the people at the table who come from a different uh, field. So I'm doing postgrad studies at the moment, but my background is not in tech, my background is in politics. And so my perspective coming into, into this is really different to a lot of people that I'm studying with. And I think that that is, it can be really daunting because you're like, oh my God, I didn't do undergrad stats, uh, but I bring something else, which I think is valuable. And I think that that helps with that sort of deliberate making change in the future, because you can come in from the outside and be like, I don't, why are we using this thing? This is weird. And they often the reaction is like, oh, well, this is always, that's a status quo, it's always, always done. And so having um, that interdisciplinary aspect, I think is, is really, really important. I think I can feel the energy in the room lagging. Is anyone ready to wind up? Well, maybe just one left. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Uh, hi. Hello. Thanks for this wonderful evening. Uh, my name is Angela. I'm a PhD student from this university, and I did a my honors on electronics engineering. So I definitely yeah, have gone through all this experience of being women and being surrounded by male and all that comes with it. So I was kind of thinking about what you said, Sam, that the oppressor, oppressed people shouldn't uh, carry all the burden. And I was also thinking that, yeah, that's true. And this is great to have these kind of events. But also, I was wondering, what do you think about uh, not only having this and push for you know, equality in the, within universities and in the workplace, but also challenging men who are conscious about this issue and want to help and, and tell them 
why don't you kind of step back <laughs> a little bit and and give space for women. Not only, you know, like yeah, voluntarily stepping back and uh, yeah, looking to, into the equity thing, not just the equality. I don't know if you are, uh, understand the... Yeah, no, I, so what, what was the question? So, I don't know if you agree or... In, you terms, of, in terms of getting men to take a step back? Like, with this type of advice or by telling men also to, if they agree that they, there is an issue with equity, that they should also actively hmm. be, you know, like Absolutely. giving the opportunity to the women, so for instance, not yeah. applying to every grant, every uh, more I, decision, or I don't know. I agree, but I can see why that is threatening to people. I can see why that is uh, quite a confronting notion to give up space that you, if you know, one of the um, you know side effects of having privilege for so long is that it, the, the prospect of, of giving that up is quite confronting. And so, uh, well, yes, I agree. I think that that is, um, is sort of a tricky line to take. Um, but I do think that, yeah, if you, if you, if you know men who, who are on the side, um, encouraging them to, even like in the workplace, um, they could be a little bit more conscious of not uh, always taking up all the space in meetings, not always talking all the time, making sure that, you know, that, that, that everyone's voice is heard. Little tiny things like that add up, and I think people underestimate how that can make change as, they, as, as more of that starts to happen. So it doesn't necessarily have to be like, don't apply for that grant. Someone else, you know, a, a woman should get that grant. Like, uh, and they can still apply for the grant. Um, but there are so many little ways that they can make a real difference. And I think a big part of that is, is listening, is listening to the women around them and believing their experiences. Um, and not just by sort of dismissing, like if, if someone is, is having a, a, a bad time at uni or, or at work related to this kind of issue, not, uh, yeah, not, not dismissing it as, as not as just because they haven't experienced it themselves. Perhaps also taking time to care for their children might be something they could yes. contribute <laughs> to gender equality. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Cleaning up after themselves and then after everybody else. Uh, I think we should take a few pieces of pictures outside over a glass of wine. Yes, <laughs> let's, um, let's list all the ways. Um, thank you so much for being patient with us. Thank you for attending. Can you please thank our lovely panel?